Is there something that, however much we try, a machine can never, ever do? Is there a limit to technology? If you're currently thinking of something, you can just shout it out. Just shout it out to me. What, what could be a limit of technology? Anyone? So, what was that? Fashion? Oh, compassion. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, we wouldn't want to teach them emotion, because we know how vulnerable it makes us as a human, right? What was that? Sorry, there? Procreation. Procreation. But then we do have uh, 3D printers being able to 3D print 3D printers, so I feel like we're getting on the way there. Uh, any others? Sorry? A fart? <laughs> I think we're better off if we leave that one out of uh, technology. But I think these are fair, fair questions uh, and limits. Uh, so I want to explore a very specific limit with all of you uh, in a couple of minutes. Uh, and I, in doing so, I will try three things that I don't think have ever been done before on a TEDx talk. But I will need a noun, any single word noun, like cat or broccoli from you guys. Apple, sure, uh, we'll take Apple, uh, and we'll get back to that in a couple of minutes. Thank you very much. So this question of limit of technology is something that really fascinates me, because I remember as a child, I saw this computer, and I was like, well, this computer is like magic. It can do anything. It was just me as a kid who wasn't powerful enough to wield all of it yet. But then you reach university, and, and suddenly in one of your first lectures, they teach you actually there is a limit, and it's called the halting problem. Now, the halting problem is, is this thing, you can kind of relate to it as when you were uh, using your computer, you were uh, asking it to do something, doesn't really matter what, and you had this wheel of death. And you just wondered, like, will I ever get an answer, or will I just have to like, wait forever? And it turns out this, this is not a trivial task, and, and you cannot really know the answer to this problem for any given program at all of the time. And this is known as the halting problem. However, you quickly learn that even though there is this, this theoretical limit, that it doesn't necessarily halt our practical applications. This limit has been around for decades, and, and we've still made so much progress. So then you start to wonder, well, we have this theoretical limit, but it doesn't really matter in practice. Is there a practical limit? Uh, and then you hear all kinds of people hypothesizing all kinds of limits, maybe compassion, maybe farting. Uh, but then you also realize uh, throughout the study that you, all of these other limits that people thought uh, were limits of technology that then happened. Like, for example, playing chess better than the best humans, or uh, maybe that computers could never be small enough to be portable. All kinds of limits that have already been surpassed. And then you kind of realize that it's, this limit is more like a constantly moving threshold between what we consider to be something human, and humans do best, and something that technology does best. It's kind of like we're losing our humanity to technology, and we're kind of trying to deny this. And even throughout my study, we've seen this limit or threshold being moved multiple times. We saw complex games like Go and Dota 2 being mastered by a technology. Or we even saw like, musical artists that, after decades of music generation research, finally embraced these generation algorithms and, and, and co-created music together. And they showed that the sum of humans and AI is larger than its components. So then you finish your study and, and, you, and you enter the real world where you have to uh, solve real problems um, for real people with real software, and suddenly you encounter these limits again. You ask for a feature and then you very often get 
uh, the response like, well, implementing this feature is not really possible. And I even hear myself say this sometimes to people, and, and then there's always this little voice in my head that then goes, ah, is this it? Is this the limit? Have we finally discovered it after all of these years? And the answer is, of course, usually, well, probably not. Usually, it has to do with other factors, like maybe it would require too much work, too much cash, too much man hours. Or maybe it's something that is not very well defined. Like if we say art is an abstract message from humans to other humans, well then by definition, technology can never do this. And then sometimes we, we think, oh, we need a very exact solution, but then an approximation is fine, and maybe the approximation is actually feasible. And I think in all of these, it's actually the human that is kind of the limit here. And I think that's because we, as humans, we build technology. So it's not unreasonable that technology is limited by us. Because we, as humans, we are the pioneers of technology. And maybe if, if we see a limit, maybe this just means that a human hasn't spent enough time to do the, to make technology do this particular task. So maybe a limit might actually be a frontier, something you can do for the very first time. So then you might wonder, well, can technology then do, do everything? Can they do what, what they have done, that, that like what we have done for you tonight as static speakers, who spent weeks or even months crafting these talks for you? Can an AI write TEDx slides? So, during this talk, there has been an AI that has been generating a slide deck based on the suggestion of Apple that we got. And I want to try something together here with you. Uh, I've never seen these slides. I will see them as quickly as you see them, uh, which is very late. I will have to fully improvise on these slide decks. And as far as I know, this will be the first time that the, couple, that the following three things have been done on a TEDx talk. An AI-generated TEDx talk, improvisation together with an artificial intelligence on a TEDx stage, and a TEDx talk within another TEDx talk. But before we do this, I would like you all to join me in a small little ritual, uh, which I learned from my collaborator, Corey Matthewson. And we do always do this whenever we improvise together with an artificial intelligence on stage. And it's very simple. Just breathe in together, all with me, and lower your expectations. <laughs> Hello, my name is Thomas Winters. I'm a doctor in polyapple technology. If you don't know what that means, it's basically just the opposite of monoapple technology, which is the study of people that only own one Apple product, which is weird because usually you buy into the whole Apple ecosystem. And we're not talking about Apple, the technology now, we're just talking about Apple, so let's just focus on that having multiple apples, and I, there's one thing in particular that I want to tell you about, something that happened in my life that changed my view on apples, and I want to share that with you to hopefully change your vision on apples too. And that is the worst thing that you can ever imagine about apples. So let's start where it all started with me. Hey. <laughs> Boring statistics. People that think that this beautiful fruit is just a computer. As I mentioned earlier, there's nothing that frustrates me more. It's all about these mono-apple technologists. And you can see it here plotted. It's very clear data, I think. It shows that there's a clear correlation in some direction. 
And that got me furious. And this led me to do this thing. I miswrote Macintosh. Ha <laughs> ha <laughs> That'll teach him. And I said, this is bad. See? This is just one board. Who needs one board? You know, if you have an apple, an actual fruit, you can just plug it in a USB stick and, and an HDMI cable, and it just makes a new board for you. Can your Apple computer do that? I don't think so. Even worse, that's me when, when I see you with, with your Apple technology. I'm in a raincoat near your house and just staring creepily at you. And the worst thing is, <laughs> they got rid of their rounded corners and made all of the corners square. I think we should let this sink in. <laughs> the apple tree in the background, just barely visible, was stretching a single limb out of her, as if wanting to be in the photo with her. You know, back in the day, and I'm talking about like the 1800s and then earlier, people were painting. And what were people painting? They were painting nice fruit bowls full of nice fruity apples and bananas and well, mostly apples. And now what do we see on all of these pictures of people on Instagram? They're always showing off their new iPhone, iPad, i whatever. We're losing touch with, with what we want to be photographed and that's nature. You might be wondering, Anne, <laughs> why would I care about this? What does this have to do with the worst thing about apples? Well, it's answered in this slide. <laughs> Look at this beautiful apple. It's nice and round. It's juicy. Admit it, who here in the audience wants to bite that apple? Raise your hand. See, most people would want to. If, there, this, if this is an iPhone, who would want to bite that iPhone? See, no one. Yeah, that's my brother. I mean, he, he juggles with apples. It's the worst thing about apples you've never noticed. Thank you very much. If you want to play with this yourself, there is a, a less restricted version of this also on uh, talkgenerator.com. Feel free. Uh, so while this... AI-generated TEDx talk might have been quite quirky. Um, I think it's still important to sometimes realize when we say, well, technology cannot do something, this is a limit of technology, to just really reevaluate where this limit comes from. Is this, a, is this a true limit? Can we prove that it's a limit? Because if not, then maybe this limit might be a frontier, something we can do for the very first time, something society has always made us do and has done in the past ever, ever again. So I think I'll leave you with that. And uh, remember, apple fruit is just much better than the apple technology. Thank you very much.